Welcome to Penn State Dickinson Law's Profiles in Leadership series. My name is Daryl Lim. I serve as the H. Letty Montag Chair and Associate Dean for Research and Innovation at the Law School. This series offers an unparalleled opportunity to glean insights from top leaders who serve in government, education, the private sector, and civil society. In each episode, we sit down with these leaders to reflect on their journey with them and share uh, hear about the skills, core values, qualities that make them the leaders they are today. We're very pleased to have Kevin Noonan, uh, who is co-chair of MBHB's Biotechnology and Pharmaceuticals Practice Group. Dr. Noonan is an experienced patent lawyer, molecular biologist, and renowned thought leader in biotechnology and pharmaceutical patent law. Over the past 30 years, he has counseled some of the largest biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies in the world on intellectual property issues. Dr. Noonan is the co-founder and regular contributor to Patent Docs, a website featuring news and commentary on patent law. He is also a co-editor and contributing author of the book Claim Construction and the Federal Circuit, and a contributing author of Antitrust Issues in, in Intellectual Property Law, now in its second edition. Prior to becoming an attorney, Dr. Noonan was a molecular biologist, earning a doctorate from Princeton University and uh, a National Cancer Institute postdoctoral fellow. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Daryl. Good to see you again. Good to see you. So there's a lot of signs in your bio uh, talk to us about looking at the law through the lens of science, or if you like in particular, the lens of molecular biology. Well, you know, obviously when, when doing what I do, and the reason I got into doing this was because I had the background when I did started this 33 years, 34 years ago, this, uh, this August, um, you know, we were PhDs in science, particularly molecular biology, were kind of the flavor of the week. For law for law firms, um, because the technology, the biotechnology in patent law started with chemist John McDonald, who was my mentor, who was a chemist, not a molecular biologist, and you needed that background both because uh, you you knew more about the science, you could talk to the scientists, um, and and they would not have to teach you. Uh, I had a client once say that the worst part of their job was having to teach lawyers about science. And what was uh, made it even worse is that if there was any amount of time between when they first talked to them and when they next talked to them, they would have forgotten everything that they had taught them in the interim. And that was probably an exaggeration. But the way I explain it to people is, you know, to the extent that there was a corner of my brain that understood molecular biology, when somebody told me something, I had a place to put it. So that if I had to retrieve it, it wasn't quite as difficult as it would be if I was just a lawyer and didn't have that background. Um, you know, the difference, I said this when I went to law school to some colleagues, is that the, 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 the logic of science and law is similar. But two things are different. One is you kind of have to turn your brain 90 degrees to understand uh, law if you come from a science background. And the second thing is that people lie. And even though you can make a mistake in in uh, science, you can do a, an experiment improperly. You know, uh, Einstein said God doesn't throw dice, and whether he did he does or he doesn't, uh, it doesn't come around like a gremlin and change your results uh, serendipitously. So you have to be a little bit more aware of of applying logic with a little bit more of a skeptical eye uh, when you do law. Uh, and that even applies to, you know, when you're trying to write a patent application, you want to make sure that you properly describe it um, and that you know, as much as the hopes, the dreams, the desires of your clients may rest on what it says, you have to make sure that if if the line is supposed to be straight, that it really is that sort of thing. And and so, it, it you know, that's a value add that you have that scientific perspective that you can give to your clients, including their inventors, um, to understand what their invention is and to help them distill it into patent applications and ultimately patents. So people often think of IP lawyers as lawyers in this esoteric group and they think they're all the same. I mean, just that my question and your response to my first question shows there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity and the types of lawyers. 
you and I both know a whole bunch of copyright lawyers and trademark lawyers. You are a patent lawyer. What do you right. think are the differences between these three different types of lawyers? Well, I mean, you know, copyright is probably the narrowest, right? You, It's a right to prevent people from copying. So you can have someone, uh, what is it? Um, uh, was it the wind be gone? The, the uh, gone with the wind taken from the slaves perspective that can cause the brouhaha. We've had the Andy Warhol stuff in the Supreme Court lately. Um, I think that that is very much, well, how did you copy it? How much did you copy it? And the, 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 the demarcation between an idea which can't be copyrighted and an expression of an idea which can. Trademark is obviously more commercial to the extent that it's, it's um, tied to a product usually and tied to say goodwill and that sort of thing patents is really i think um the more creative on both sides you know obviously copyright law covers very creative things um uh, just look at taylor swift for an example um uh, incredibly creative people who can do incredible things that the rest of us can't um the same thing is true for for in in, in patenting but but the infringers are creative too um because you know patent law is meant to protect what somebody has done, but the 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 aphorism is you build a better mousetrap, which implies that there was a mousetrap to begin with. And a lot of patent law involves people who have taken one idea and expanded upon it, uh, taken an invention and improved it, changed it. And then, you know, the, the argument always is, well, did you change it enough not to infringe? Uh, I was teaching last night, I teach uh, biotech patent law at, at UIC, it used to be John Marshall. And we we're talking about the fact that you know, typically you have a claim and many times what you'll see in cases is that the patentee tries to expand the scope of the claim so it covers what the infringer did. And in doing that, the problem is that, that they then frequently then exceed the scope of their disclosure. And I would say the last 10 years about the federal circuit and more recently with the Amgen v. Sanofi case, the Supreme Court, has been to kind of cabin in the, the scope of claims to be much more closely tied to what an inventor patent lawyer ultimately puts in the specification what was actually done. And the penumbra around the specific picture claim has gotten narrow for that reason. So you have creativity on both sides. Um, obviously, getting a patent just gives you a right to exclude, doesn't give you a right to do anything. And so our job as patent lawyers is to try to distill what the what the inventors have done in a useful way that can protect things that are commercially valuable um, in a way that that can actually have some some teeth in preventing people from infringing, or or as some uh, folks say, efficiently infringing um, what uh, what the inventor has invented. Now, a lot of people say that patent system in the U.S. has gotten weaker, and innovation in the U.S. is uh, not quite as attractive as it used to be 10, 20 years ago. And folks like China and other jurisdictions are overtaking the U.S. What's your take on that? Well, okay. So first of all, I think that, you know, Lincoln said that, that, you know, um, invention is, is, um, sparks the fire of genius. I think people invent all the time. Why? Because we're curious. We want to solve problems. We want to do things. And the question is how much protection can you give those inventions and can you give them sufficient protection to be, um, commercially, uh, an investment, uh, reasonable. So I think that that has patent law hasn't it's gone through one of its pendulums. I mean, I when I started thirty four years ago, patent law, which had especially biotech patent law, which had been very boom boom in the eighties, you know, Arthropoetin and all that sort of stuff, um, had slowed down a little. The patent office had started to retrench a little about the scope of claims they were giving. Uh, in fact, the the powerful story is that uh, President Clinton's um, commissioner of patents, whose name, of course, I forget now, went to the bio meeting one year and somebody purportedly David Chisholm, but I'm not sure it was it was him. Um, uh, sorry, Donald Chisholm um, was uh, stood up and said to him, you know, a lot of us sitting in this room think you should just change the name to the no patent and trademark office and be done with it. And he got a round of applause. And this commissioner was so upset, he went back to um, to the, the examining corps and said, we're in the business to provide protection for our clients, most of whom are Americans at the time anyway. And so that's your job. So don't be excessively obstructionist. And it took a while for that to take. But say in the 90s to probably around the turn of the century, you did have 
uh, on the one hand, very expansive patenting, and the other, very much the federal circuit coming into its own and kind of defining um, whether it was in obviousness with the TSM test or written description with the Eli, Eli Lilly case, kind of defining the meets and bounds to make it much more predictable of how, what you could get patented and what you couldn't. Then the Supreme Court strikes back. Uh, in the in the aughts, mostly due to academic uh, criticisms, the patents as, as a tax on innovation criticisms, and starts to impose its will a little bit more in the eBay case, which made it hard to get an injunction, which means it made it easier to efficiently infringe when only money was on the table for the possible um, downside from that. And KSO, which turned out to be more of a nothing burger as than we thought on obviousness, and of course, Mayo and Myriad, and Alice at the you know the turn of the into the teens, where all of a sudden whole swaths of invention innovation was no longer patentable, and the, most of those swaths had to do with um, with diagnostic methods. But to give you an idea of how pernicious this has gotten, there was recently a case out of Delaware by a very well respected judge. In fact, I sat on one of his trials once. He's a good judge, who decided that a recombinant cell having a heterologous piece of DNA that was put into it with a vector was a product of nature because the vector was natural, the cell was natural, and the gene was natural. It was all a product of nature. Funk Brothers, which Mayo resurrected from the dustbin of history, um, meant that that was just another, another uh, variation of something that was naturally occurring. The fact that the Supreme Court as it frequently does, intended to merely uh, create the frame, the outside boundaries of what you could patent. And the Federal Circuit, which combination of some of the more uh, patent savvy and enriched people, Judge Rich, Judge Michelle, Judge Rader, Judge Nees, uh, and all of these uh, great judges were not on the court. And given its more heter heterogeneous um, juris jurisprudence, uh, people who don't didn't know at least initially a lot about patenting. I'm not saying what they know about it now, but that wasn't their fort. So now you have a federal circuit less likely to stand up to the Supreme Court. And frankly, when Judge Rich made it, it gave an, a, an opinion, it, you got the feeling from reading some of the Supreme Court's uh, opinions that that was almost like Learned Hand was talking. I mean, this was somebody who was very well respected. He had written the 52 Act. Um, really, uh, he knew more, he'd forgotten more patenting than most people would, would really know. And so there was a, not deference so much because I don't think the Supreme Court defers, but at least paying attention and giving that side of the argument a little bit more weight. Whereas now, given all of the academic uh, pressure and no offense, Daryl, but nobody ever got tenured by saying everything was great. So you'd expect there would be some criticism in the academic community about patent law. Um, and just the fact that as uh, a former solicitor general once said at a meeting that for 20 years, the federal circuit slowly walked away from Supreme Court precedent they didn't agree with. And the Supreme Court noticed and in the aughts and the early teens uh, sort of reconfigured it to where their precedent was the only precedent that matters, which frankly, for most patent practitioners, uh, federal circuit precedent was what we dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. So you do have a, a, a contraction of the scope. I'm not sure that's entirely bad. There are some things for which the diagnostic method claims, for example, I think is very bad. But you know, generally speaking, it's within the usual error bars of sometimes you have broad patent protection, sometimes you have narrow patent protection. It really depends on the zeitgeist. And we're particularly in a, a tougher to get a patent sort of situation than we were 20 years ago. So you're not sleep, losing any sleep over it? Oh, I never lose sleep. I love what I do. Um, I, I think that, that in some ways, um, good and bad, it is the error of the creative draftsman, the creative lawyer, because a lot of the arguments that are made, whether it's in district court, the federal circuit or the Supreme Court, are clever and, and are logically uh, coherent. And they are things that make people think about the, uh, the patent law in a new way. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that the only thing that I, the only part of this that I, I am not worried about, but I'm concerned about in the sense for American innovation, is I don't want it to have to be where it takes the front page of the Wall Street Journal with a headline that says Supreme Court destroys American industry for people to maybe decide it's gone too far. I don't think it's going to get to that. 
because frankly, um, there are lots of ways you can have diagnostic assays outside the patent system, which is not good for innovation, but then we'll protect folks who can keep things as a trade secret and, and use that protection. And I think it's a waste of time and energy and resources um, and also uh, deprives the public of the benefit of a patent expiring in order for people to uh, to have innovation that way. But it's still it's still innovation, and people will still will still uh, discover things and seek to protect them. Um, I want to switch gears and shine the spotlight back on you. Uh, you very kindly gave us a good, expansive view on patent policy and innovation policy in the U.S. But uh, this is profiles and leadership, and you are the person being profiled. So let's bring uh, our listeners back to where it all started law-wise at least, uh, mm -hmm. and a number, good number of our listeners are actually law students, so this is something which relates directly to where they are here and now. Where did you go to law school? Okay, so um, within a week, I quit my job as a postdoc, changed careers, started as a, a, a law clerk at uh, at the Allegheny Wait from Allegheny Whitcoff, going to law school tonight, which at the time was John Marshall. I also moved and got married. I think the only thing in the you know cosmopolitan list of stress uh, stressful situations I didn't do is I didn't lose a parent, thank God. Um, but I had a lot of change very very quickly, and so I started first. I had to wear a suit for one back then, but I started getting up in the morning, going to a law firm. Um, working all day and then at night, uh, 5.30ish, going over to start classes at six o'clock. They lasted from six to nine o'clock. And sometimes I had to go back to the firm to do things and sometimes I didn't. So it was a very intense time where I, I, I analogized it to if you take a, a science course, you know, like organic chemistry in college, you go to the lecture, um, you know, three days a week, nine o'clock in the morning for an hour, and then you have a lab that you go to once or twice a week and, and do experiments. And I was, I had it backwards. I did the lab part during the day, uh, you know, being and preparing patent applications, writing office action responses, that sort of thing. And then at night I went to school and, and learned about law. Now, when you said you wore a suit, it's for work, not for law school, right? No, no, it was for work. No, we, we were, we had gotten past, this was not Harvard. This was not, you know, Kingsford or Kingsbury, whatever his name was from, from 1L. This was, uh, no, no, we, uh, we did not wear suits in law school. Actually, that's not exactly true. I did wear a suit. I wasn't going to change. Right. I mean, I, I, so I, I was coming from work. I had a suit on. I wore a suit to class. I, it I'm didn't surprised they let you in. It's sort yeah. of changing the, the dress code the other way around. Yeah, no, I know, but it, I, I wasn't going to pressure on everybody else to dress up. No, trust me, it did nothing of the sort. <laughs> I guarantee you it did nothing of the sort. So why did you choose to go to John Marshall? Well, I mean, a couple of things. One is at the time, um, you know, it was and it still does have quite a reputation for IP law. Um, people that had done what I had done, had done, you know, uh, I would uh, Wayne Cowan, uh, Jim Gumina. Um, I think Dave Frischkorn, I had also gone to John Marshall when they had done something similar to what I had done, who were at the firm. And so, you know, and, and of course the biggest, uh, the biggest reason is that they gave me money. You know, I got scholarship money, uh, to be able to go. So it didn't cost me, I think at the end of the day, it cost me very little to go, um, because one, it wasn't that expensive. And two, I, I, um, every time I got a raise at work, I told them not to give me the money, but to keep the money and to, if I had a bill from John Marshall, they would pay it. And so this way, I, I, I remember I came from making $24,000 a year to making $50,000 a year. So I, it was really quite a, a, an uptick in, in my standard of living. So I didn't notice, you know, five and $6,000 raises that much in terms of a day to day, but having that nest egg to pay a tuition bill was, came in very handy. So, you know, and, and of course, I, I also uh, had a certain, it was certainly a commitment that I didn't have to pay them back, but I had to actually work for them, which I did um, uh, for three years um, after, after I finished law school. What do you remember of your time at law school? Well, okay. So I remember the, I remember, I remember in, in contracts, 
um, Professor Schrager, a great contract professor, asked me a question. And I said, Professor, I got to tell you, I don't really know why these people had a dispute. And I figure they didn't know either because that's why we're here. That's why they're in a lawsuit together. They didn't agree anyway. And he laughed. He said, well, you're right, but try. try. Uh, so the first semester was as it always is, that twisting your brain into a pretzel. Um, I, I would read a case and there'd probably be a hundred facts that were in the in the case, and three of them were important. And it was figuring out and determining which three they were. And as you might imagine, um, initially that wasn't that easy and it got easier as the semester went along. And so after that first semester, I think I was in pretty good shape in terms of law school. It was a lot of reading, but frankly, I read a lot anyway. And so it wasn't that difficult. The case book is not that difficult to read. And, you know, and, and it's a story, if you think about it. You know, there's some facts and there's a, talking about the law and what the, the court decided. So it's not uninteresting. Um, and, you know, and so I, I thought that uh, it got better, I guess I'll say. And then I went to law school at, at, during the summers as well. So I took two courses in the summer and um, uh, Joni Peniera, who was the, uh, who was the, the sort of that, she wasn't a dean, I don't think at the time, I think she's just the, the person in the office. I was constantly finagling, taking extra courses because I wanted to get out in three years and, uh, having the PhD sort of, and having reasonably good grades helped because, well, you're only allowed to have this many hours. It's like, well, you know, I'm doing pretty good and I must be a pretty smart guy. And okay, you can take it. But if you don't do well, we're going to not prevent, let you do it next semester. So I was able to take, you know, four rather than three courses each semester, that sort of thing. So I got out in three years, which was, which was, uh, which I wanted to do. So was it all work or did you have fun? Well, I have, see, that's the thing. I have fun doing this. Um, I have fun. I have cats, as you know, and I have fun with my cats. My wife is entertaining. Um, I, I go to concerts frequently. I mean, I, I read a lot and not just law stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I pretty much, the good news is what some, if, if you like what you're doing, you will never work a day in your life. I think that, um, I like what I'm doing. And so did you have fun? Yeah, this is fun. Um, and law school was fun. Law school wasn't exactly like law school was fun in a painful kind of way because you yeah, it wasn't competition so much. It sounds like an oxymoron, fun in a painful. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. Well, well, some people fun is pain. Well, something else. Let's not go there. <laughs> Let's not go there. Uh, I would say that the only other thing I would say about that is that even though I think the professors at John Marshall were were good people, uh, the last year that I was I took I was there going to, during the day, and um, I noticed this a little bit more stringency a little bit less uh, understanding of the, the students and unpreparedness then uh, i think that although if you were unprepared you were in trouble um i think there was a certain amount of of, of recognition that everybody sitting there at eight o'clock at night had been to work you know first thing in the morning and had a very long day so let's not gratuitously give them a hard time okay let's make them you know reach the standard that we need them to reach but you know let's not belabor it so I think that that um, it wasn't maybe as painful as a night student as it would have been for for a day student for me anyway. So then you graduate and a full fledged attorney come to the bar. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to start thinking strategically for your client dealing with the other side. Uh, talk to us about how you develop strategic thinking. Well, I think that as I said, John McDonald was my mentor. John was a wonderful man who gave me a lot more leash than I would give my junior people. <laughs> he had a great deal of confidence in us. And I think that made us want to earn that confidence. But I was always in, even when I was just started, I was in client meetings. Um, I would watch him. And I, 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 I think that there were certainly meetings I can remember. Sorry about that. Uh, that. John could give you the impression that he had thought about your technology more than you have. And of course, that wasn't the case, but he had thought about it enough that he'd ask the right questions. He'd think about all the ways that things could go wrong. And, and I took that as now I was on a conference, a client call yesterday on, on a license that they were looking at. And I tell my junior people, uh, think about it um, as if, number one, not something you can't 
foresee goes wrong. And number two, what I call the beer truck rule, everybody involved is hit by a beer truck. And so you just have the document. That's the only thing you know is what's in the document. Have you, to the extent you can, covered the, the contingencies and, and what happens if things go wrong. And I think that putting yourself in the client's shoes and especially focusing on not necessarily the opportunities, because they're usually very, very cognizant of those, but let's make sure you're protected if things don't work out. Um, I think that that level of caring um, is what they respond to. And the only way you're really going to do it is to, I think the first thing I do when I when I meet a client is I, I try to find out as much about their business as possible, as much about their future strategy as possible. Many times it'll be in the January and I'll call a client and say, okay, so what's changed? What's different? You know, it's now a new year. What are your plans? That sort of thing. Only because, you know, a lot of what we do and whether it's successful or not, depends very much on, on the business realities. And if you don't understand somebody's business, it's going to be very, very hard for you to give them good legal advice because there are all sorts of things that could happen that if you don't know about them could be a problem. Um, and, and the best way to find out is to ask. And most people like talking about themselves, even me. And so I think that uh, if you ask the question, um, if you ask the question about somebody's business and what their plans are and that sort of thing, you'll learn things. You won't even know the right question to ask, but in asking the more generic question, the more general question, you'll find if you pay attention, you'll you'll get information that will lead to another question and maybe another question. And finally, you'll get a piece of information you didn't have before that maybe neither you nor the client realized you didn't have before. And that sometimes could be the important the important question to ask. So, you know, it's very much like anything else we do in, in law, just, you know, ask questions. So how, how much of that depends on the, the, the trust and confidence that your client has in you? I imagine the answer is quite a bit. Oh, yeah. And then the answer is, how do you develop that? Well, again, I think that if you go in and you can impress, first of all, the client has to believe you have the the understanding, the intelligence, the experience to understand their business, which is where the law science part comes in. Because if you can't really speak their language, then you just, it's like anything else. If you can be on the same page with somebody who has an invention, which by definition is new, um, but all the ancillary background parts of it that you need to know you're on top of and also can lead you to ask questions about the technology. The sort of, you know, there was a great um, what if commercial for Hewlett Packard when Hewlett Packard still existed. They probably still do, but they're not on TV anymore. 30 years ago. And that was the whole thing. They asked what if, right, as a way to think about innovation. I think that that's a lot of things that what we do is try to think about, and maybe not what if, but, you know, okay, you do it this way. What other ways are it to do it? You use this particular component. Are there other components you could substitute out for them? You know, delving into the science part, you get a lot more about the technology and you do the same thing with the business. Uh, I think that if you, if you are on top of that and then they get the feeling that not only, as I said before, you care about and have thought about their business, but you have intuitive, constructive, um, positive things to say. And maybe if you're lucky, things they haven't thought about, then I think all of those things build up confidence um, that you're somebody that they can entrust uh, with, with, you know, really their livelihood. The difference between being a scientist and being a lawyer to me is that if I made a mistake in an experiment, if I did something careless or thoughtless, um, I it was I suffered. Right now, my PI might not have been very happy with me, but it was my experiment, so I suffered. Good reason not to be careless. Well, with with clients, it's like you're carrying a basket full of eggs across the bumpy bumpy ground. They're not your eggs. Right. And so you have to be really careful not to drop any of them because it's somebody else's livelihood. It's somebody else's invention. And and I'm not even talking about the liability if you make a mistake. Frankly, mistakes happen all the time. You feel horrible when a mistake happens. And so the thing that I do is make sure that for every possible mistake that I can think of, I know what I could do to fix it. Because when mistakes happen, you have to tell a client, but the first thing they want to hear after a mistake happened or a problem has arisen, here's how we're going to fix it. Sometimes it's not perfect, but even if you if you have a plan, right, they may be mad at you, they may be unhappy with you, they may ultimately fire you, which thank God hasn't happened. Uh, but but 
they're really not going to be happy if you don't have a way to deal with the problem that's arisen, whether it's your fault or not, frankly, because problems happen sometimes through no fault of your own, but they just happen. Things don't always run smoothly. And then, well, what do you do about it? They look to you for that answer. How do we fix it? How do we recoup our, the, as much of our position as we can? And that's just part of the, the kind of this, what I'll call the standard of care that clients respond to. I'm not sure they all either know that they need it or thought about it, but certainly they respond to it if you can give it to them. How much litigation do you do? You know, I've only, I've been involved in, I'm like the cooler. Every litigation I've been involved with um, has settled, uh, which I think ultimately is good for the client. Uh, I'm not a first chair litigator. I never was. I tended to be involved with uh, experts, um, which means I've met a lot of, I met Nobel, Nobel Prize winners and that sort of thing. I had a great time doing that. Um, you know, done, done a reasonable number of depositions in that uh, uh, role, but, you know, amount of actual court time, not all that much, because as I said, things tend to settle when I'm involved. So good so, for the client, I mean, that good for me. <laughs> I, I'm guessing that compared to a lot of your colleagues who are litigators, you have a lot more control over your calendar. Well, yes and no. I think you're right uh, that that um, now that I've been home for um, for a few years, more than at, at the office because of the pandemic, my wife says, you know, do you spend all your time on phone calls? It's like, yeah. And if somebody like this morning, somebody said a phone call at eight o'clock and she said, I thought you had a call at nine. I said, yeah, this is something else because can't you ever tell them no? It's like heaven for Fen. <laughs> no, I can't tell them no. If somebody wants to talk to me, I'm going to talk to them. So yes, I mean, you, litigators can get pulled all over the world. I mean, I've done my share of, one time we flew, Paul Berghoff and Jim Goodman and I flew to Oxford, to London, and uh, went to Oxford, got off the plane, got cleaned up, went to Oxford, spent all day with an expert witness, um, went to dinner with the expert witness um, that night. Uh, next morning, got up early, spent the morning, and then got on a plane back to back to uh, Chicago. So, you know, I mean, I've done things like that, but uh, but not the way, I mean, if you want to be a frequent flyer, become a litigator because you'll be in the air a lot, okay? And, uh, and so not to that level, but there, certainly there have been times. So, patent dogs. Ah, yes. It's a great story. Uh, Let's hear it. I will give Don Zoon credit, my partner credit for this. Uh, we, I was doing, dabbling, doing a little bit of writing um, back before we started the blog. And we knew Dennis Crouch, of course. And Don had talked well, to Dennis. Just, just uh, for the benefit of folks that don't know Dennis Crouch. Dennis Crouch uh, used to work for us. He was an associate for us. His wife got um, a fellowship uh, at... Um, somewhere in Boston for a master's in public health. And he went and was an adjunct professor at either Boston College or Boston University. I always get them mixed up, uh, my apologies. And he had started with us writing uh, patently O, which initially was patently obvious, but he changed to patently O because there was some uh, uh, problem with using patently obvious. And um, and I had dabbled. He used to occasionally put what I wrote on, on Noonan's corner office kind of thing, very nice of him. And Don had talked to him about a blog and he came to my office and he said, we should do this. And he said, but I gotta tell you, uh, Dennis said, we really need to write every day, have, publish something every day. And I said, well, Don, not to be uh, critical, um, but I've been trying to get you to write, you know, sporadically for other things and you never, you never seem to want to. So do you really want to do it? And he did. And he left my office and I thought for about 10 minutes and I said, all right, you know, you're right. I'm being dumb, let's do this. And so um, uh, we both claim credit for coming up with patent docs. Um, I, I think I came up with the with the um, um, nucleic acid, the kind of logo and the background of it. Um, and he actually, the new one has um, in in ASCII um, uh, patent docs because we've expanded it to be more than just biotech and pharma. But we started, you know, in October, I think, of two thousand six. And it was a great time to do this because at that time we had the, the rubbing rumblings from Michael Crichton and others about the gene patenting stuff. 
we had the uh, BPCIA and, and follow-on biologics, as they were called at the time. We had the various permutations of the uh, America Invents Act, because there were two or three bills before that. We had the infamous claims and continuation rules that were proposed by the Patent Office, stimulated by um, then not Judge Moore and Mark Lemley and some of their academic writings that there was some abuse that was going on, uh, permitting people to have too many continuations or too many claims, which I hear is the there's rumblings that's going to come back, God help us. And there was just a lot to write about. And so we did. And we wrote about it, you know, every day. We also had um, about a half a dozen junior people who wrote, you know, more sort of factual sort of pieces about new patents that have been granted or things that had happened in district court synopses of that and so you know we were very very fortunate to be able to do that and 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 have subscribers um that uh, anywhere from six to ten thousand were in some league not at all like patent and the old, but but we have quite a few people who every morning get an email from us every time we publish which has gone down a little bit in frequency since the pandemic, but I think we're going to ramp up again uh, because frankly, I, I think it's great to do. It's a lot of fun to do. And frankly, I think it's very good for junior people to do. And I wish more of them did it because it looks like it's kind of like playing tennis. It looks like it's going to really be hard to learn to do and take a lot of time and effort initially maybe like law school but afterwards it really isn't that hard and it gives you the opportunity to pontificate to you know to 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 think to propose to say how could we deal with this problem what's wrong with this policy how should the law be changed all of those things which are ways to establish um the amount of expertise you talked about how clients trust you paul Berghoff once said to me that nobody hires you unless they know you and for most people toiling away as associates and younger people in a, in a law firm, they'll be known by the people they work with, the clients they work with. And that can work out just fine. And it has for a lot of people. But we kind of, the blog kind of projects what you think and what you do uh, to the people who subscribe to it. And, you know, we've been very careful to always give credit. Uh, one of our former partners had a, his own blog, and he was always the byline. Didn't matter who wrote, it was his byline. As you might imagine, fewer people wrote from over time, and I don't think that blog is anymore. We've always given, if you write it, your name's on it. And I think that that's great for recognition for people. And we've had some people, Mike Barella, one of my partners, his, an, an AI person, uh, uh, was a Mayo Alice person before AI got to be big, who's written a lot about that. And he's had invitations to speak at meetings. He's you know quoted in IP Law 360 because he, where did they find out about him? They read a piece on the blog. They called him up. Reporters call me up all the time for that reason. Uh, because they they know the name. And so if somebody, if they need a quote, they can call me up and maybe they get it, maybe they don't, but at least they're not wasting their time trying. So I was going to ask you about measuring success. And it sounds like, you know, getting that press attention is one measure of success. Uh, how else would you measure, measure success? Well, I think that, that one of the things that if you want to have an impact, uh, and I think that success is having an impact on the world around you. Um, you know, and we all can't be president, um, you know, and that's so that's not going to happen. And I would be a lousy politician anyway. But to the extent that you talk, you call me a thought leader, you have to have thoughts and you have to have a way to to um, let those thoughts get out into the world. Some people write law review articles, which is fine, um, but uh, it's much more immediate to do something like the blog. And, you know, I've, as you said, been involved with um with the claim construction book, which I thank Ed Manzo, who uh, who started doing that as a loose leaf for the uh, Illinois uh, Happy Lawyers Association of Chicago um, in 2006 or so, and and got a contract with West, and now he's retired, and so Adam Kelly from Venable and myself, who've been a long time involved with this, uh, are the editors now. Um, the antitrust book was something that some folks, some other lawyers here, Ed Ronan, I think, was the one who called me up. Um, but Brad Layerlo was involved, uh, local Chicago lawyers to write something about this. And so we wrote the first edition in 2015 and I wrote the chapter on uh, ANDA litigation because you recall that the big, um, the big, uh, ANDA or the big antitrust and patent law issue back then was when the FTC, the Actavis case came down to the Supreme Court 
after at least a decade or more of the FTC trying to prevent what they call pay for delay settlements in and litigation, which usually was because the, the branded NDA holder would give the, the generic uh, the permission to go on the market earlier than they would have otherwise waiting for the patents to expire. And then that would settle the end litigation, which of course put the patents at risk. And except for the Third Circuit, uh, in the Actavis case, every other circuit recognized that there was nothing inherently anti-competitive about that. Uh, and FTC had wanted it to be a per se Sherman Act violation. And um, Justice Breyer, God bless him, said, no, this is much more rule of reason situation. Didn't give it a, a, um, a clean bill of health as the other district, the circuit courts had done, but did at least give some room for there to be an argument about it. So we, we I wrote mostly about that. I also, I think, wrote the litigation chapter in that one, mostly because the, there wasn't anybody else to do it. And then this time, somebody else took over and revised the litigation chapter, and I just did the ANDA, but now we added the PPCIA. And in the interim, we also had many years of how the courts and the FTC had dealt with the Actavis decision and applying the rule of reason to these circumstances. And so a much more sort of a fuller story. Um, but, you know, people asked me. And Ed called me up and asked me if I'd be interested. He asked me probably because he'd heard of me, probably through the blog. And I think that um, in if you want to ask a guiding principle is always say yes. I have younger people say, well, I've never done that before. It's like, that's fine. You never did anything you haven't done before before. When somebody asks you what up opportunity comes around, you see a conflict check and somebody's doing something that is interesting, you um, you say yes. And if you haven't done it before, you tell the person because some of the tasks require experience and some don't. But even if you only get to the 10 yard line the first time, next time you'll know what better and you'll do, you'll do better. I remember we had the first patent term extension I ever did. Client had called up one of my partners and I mean, God bless him. He came in with this document, almost like it was kryptonite. And he said, do you think you can handle this? And I looked at it and I said, well, I've never done it before, but I can certainly try. And I walked down the, the uh, hall and I talked to one of our partners who had worked at the patent office. And I said, who do you know in the patent office who handles patent term extensions? And she told me Mary Till. And Mary is great and we're good friends now. And I called her up and I said, okay, I had known the fellow who had missed the medicine company's PTE by one day. Okay, because he thought it was a two month as opposed to a 60 day extension term for doing it. And I only knew about it because uh, John and I both knew him and he called up John and John called me to try to fix this. And the problem was, is that it wasn't fixed for, for many years um, because every time it came to Congress, uh, the AARP called it the Lawyer Ate My Homework Act and they couldn't get the problem fixed. So I knew the one thing I had to do was get it filed on time, but I figured it was complicated. I talked to Mary, she was gracious enough to look at drafts. And, you know, as I, I got, I got 1100 days patent term extension, which of course, when I told uh, the, the relationship uh, uh, council uh, partner, he said, well, yeah, but they've taken it off the market. It doesn't work all that well. So, you know, I cut my teeth on something that ultimately wouldn't have made any difference, but, but I got the opportunity to do it. And now I've done probably, well, I've probably done a dozen or so. The most recent one was funny because it was for a monkey, monkey vaccine. And I did it before anybody had ever heard of monkeypox, or at least I'd never heard of it. So it was funny, it got to be very prominent. Um, and I was glad I did a good job uh, getting them the maximum term of extension when monkeypox was a big deal about a year or so ago. Anyway, So yeah, just say yes, do as many things as you can. It makes it interesting. Um, you never get bored. And if you do all that, that's how you develop your expertise and how people then learn about you and know what you can do. So what would you say to somebody that says, well, Kevin, I look at, how prolific you are and you do all these blog posts, you're know, doing, doing all this writing. Uh, I could never do that because I don't know how to get started with this writing uh, enterprise. What, what would you say is your, your discipline or your technique in writing? Well, okay. So you, you have to like to do it. You have to be relatively proficient at it, but uh, the dirty little secret of writing a blog post about a federal circuit decision, it's very simple. Forget the first paragraph. Because the first paragraph is a place where you, you make people want to read the rest of it. And I think you need to think about how you write the rest of it before you make the first paragraph. And there's always the, the background of the case. It's IRAC. There's the background of the case. Okay. 
had, is it an ANDA case? Is it a patent office case? Or is it district court litigation? There are patents involved, which means you identify them in representative claims. Something happened below, whether it's the PTAB or the or the district court, and you know you basically just explain that, and then the federal circuit decides. Um, and there's reasons they decide, and you they they tell you what those reasons are, and so you basically just explain in what is only formulaic in its structure. But it's very, very simple to, you know, you read a case and you can, you know, I mean, I, you know, I can name that tune in, in three notes. I can probably write a blog post in 20 minutes because it's not that hard. Now, not a 60 page blog uh, opinion, but your normal one of the mill opinion. And then the only thing that is creative is that if, if there's something about the case that's interesting or that it is new law or maybe is not new law. Um, maybe there was one case the federal circuit recently had, where it's the question of whether or not you had to have disclosed, um, you know, efficacy of something. And, and they did, they, the court didn't reach that question. It was presented, but they didn't have to reach it. So they didn't. And then sometimes, especially if it's a case, a decision that annoys me, um, the last paragraph explains why I think it's a really bad decision or why I think that, you know, its implications are not are not good. Um, but but most what most people want to see is when they read a blog post about a case, they don't want to read the case. They want to read, you know, a thousand words and as opposed to a 20 page opinion, a thousand words know what the court said so that when they when they the question arises that has to do with this case or a situation arises where this case is relevant, they can remember it and go back to the blog post and then go back and read the opinion if they want to. Uh, or if the blog post gives them an incentive that they want to read the opinion, they do that. Um, but but. Getting started, it's it's inertia. We see this, frankly, with business development all the time. That you know, I think the reason I see people, younger people, not doing business development is a certain amount of fear of failure, a certain amount of not sure they know how to do it. And we have folks to help them do that um, because it's not that hard. You just have to. I remember there was a if you remember NYPD Blue. Um, there was an instance where the very first show had uh, the woman who was the DA ask Sipowitz some question and they get into a thing afterwards. They don't like each other. Several years, show years later, he asked her dinner and she says, why would I go to the dinner with you? And he says, you will, you won't. And I think that why would I hire you? Well, you will, you won't. OK, you put your best foot forward. You've done everything you can to establish your credentials, your bona fides. Some people will hire you, some people won't. And that's just, you know, that's, you just don't be afraid that somebody won't either like you or want to hire you because people are all different. So you, you do your best and, 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 you know, let the chips fall where they may. You, you, do you sense this is a generational thing that the younger people are less oh, like, I like that. I don't know. I like not to. I like not to think that. I, I've seen it in people at all levels, uh, at all generations. I think that that this generation, and we'll see how the pandemic has changed them. This generation is a little bit more um, um, introspective, maybe. I, I'm reading a book called The Exceptions about women scientists at MIT, Nancy Hopkins and Mary Lou Purdue and people like that. And it goes through most of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and I think into the 90s. And it's interesting because you see how the perception has changed about women. Um, and maybe it hasn't changed enough. I don't know. I just uh, sent a recommendation of the book to Mercedes Meyer. She'll she'll read it and she'll tell me what she thinks. But um, I think that, that every generation uh, has their perspective based on what they've gone through. And, you know, uh, there are people today who are um, who are applying for jobs that were born in the year 2000. So Ronald Reagan is history to them. Or World War II is ancient history to them. OK. And so I think that that um, and all the technological developments, um, uh, there's a there was uh, something I saw that uh, it was 100 years or less than 100 years between Kitty Hawk and landing on the moon. OK. And so uh, imagine, you know, you have in some ways you've had um, uh, innovation and technology and change from 1960 to today, from 1990 to today. That's just you wouldn't have. I remember putting a telephone into a receiver when I wanted to do something online. 
right? That was how it worked. Um, so I'm old. But, you know, I think that that the perspectives that people get, and that's why I think the pandemic is going to have a great deal of change in their perspective. Um, it's just what they've lived through and what they their expectations are. So I, I think I see plenty of younger people who work very hard. Um, uh, I do think the only thing I will say in, in support of your statement is that there's a little bit more fear of failure. Uh, and I think that may come from us. I think that it may be that the people that I worked with, like John McDonald when I was starting, were a little less, um, took a little bit less of the of the attitude, like when they were kids, they had to walk to school uphill both ways in the snow. Okay, we it was hard, but we did it. You guys are soft. I don't think I do that. I try not to. Uh, and I think that, but I think that there's sometimes you give that message that, you know, you should be willing to work 25 hours a day and I, none of us work 25 hours a day, 20 sometimes. Okay. But not for weeks on end. Um, and, you know, I think if there's a willingness to do the job that needs to be done, that's all we can ask of people. And I see that willingness um, and, and giving people opportunities, especially younger people who respond well to an opportunity to do something that they've not done before, especially client development, client business and business development. Those people are worth their weight in gold because they get it, right? They realize that their job is to become self-sufficient, independent, revenue generating uh, members of the firm. Because it's, I mean, I've seen people who spent their careers, for one of a better term, carrying the big man's bag right? Doing all the second chair work and everything and never getting their own clients. And it's just a power dynamic I don't like. Um, and and it's it's very much, I like the independence. But you have your own clients and and it gives you, you're less beholden to people. One of the things, I, I, had, a, I had an uncle, great man, a hero. I mean, literally, I mean, he was in World War II and got three battlefield promotions, which was ridiculous. Um, and, and a genuine hero, and uh, got a got a medal before he died from from France in recognition of the work that he did, the fighting he had done there, and just his life worked out that he ended up like as an appliance salesman, and and he had to go to work every day and take guff from people who you know really uh, were not were not a patch on his shoe, just the way cho choices he made and stuff. And growing up, it was like I never want to be beholden to somebody like that. I want to have some sort of independence. That's why being a scientist was very attractive because you did your own experiments. That's why being a lawyer is attractive, right? You develop your own clients. And, and I think that I, I think that people who miss that opportunity uh, do themselves a disservice. Thank you. That's just me. Lots of good stuff in there. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you're also chair of MEHB's Biopharma Practice Group. Yes, what does yes. that mean? Well, I mean, it means probably less than it does in other places because I remember when we started the firm, we really didn't have practice groups. The idea was that, you know, you didn't pigeonhole yourself to do anything in particular. Now, I'm not going to do a double E application or, you know, anything like that. But especially from the litigators, who of course, all believe they can do anything um, and don't want to be limited. I think there was that idea, let's not have practice groups. But then it became a thing in, in especially for boutique patent firms. And so... Um, you know, so then, yeah, I was a senior guy. So Don and, and myself are the are the uh, co chairs of the of that group, and that's fine. I mean, it means that mostly it means that we have meetings every once in a while that we talk about the people that are going to work. We're consulted about the people that we're thinking about hiring who do life sciences sort of work. Um, but it doesn't really. We don't get any more money for it, and we don't really do anything except that. I mean, it's not. It's not nothing, but it's it's not. There's not heavy lifting either. And, and what does being a coach chair mean? Well, it just means that Don and I confer a lot about things, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, I, and I think that you know, you do want to respect your partners, and so, um, um, especially is that a fifty-fifty coach chair, a sixty-forty coach chair? No, I, well, it depends. You know, it depends because Don is very good. And I've known Don since he was in the lab. There are organizational things uh, that Don is very, very good at. And, and I'm not. So a lot of times he'll take the lead on that from his own proclivities and the fact that I'm just not good at it. Um, but but I also think that, you know, he's he's a very fine lawyer. And, and so for me, it's good to have somebody to rely upon um, that that I know knows what he's doing and I can trust. And so um, uh, I hope he feels the same way about me, but regardless, I benefit from it. And uh, and so I think that it really does come down to just 
uh, coordination. And also, you know, if one of us happens to be not in that day or, on, you know, on a plane, um, there's another one to pick up the slack for that. So it sounds like it's a feature, not a bug. I'm sorry? A feature? Oh, yeah. Coaches. Yeah, it's a feature, yeah. not a bug. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I think, that, I think that's a good way of, of putting it. Yeah. Last question. Oh. So you talked a little bit about this already, but I'm interested to find out more because so much of leadership also is life outside of work. Uh, you do reading. What else do you do and how do you decompress? Well, it, I, I, it doesn't look like it, but I exercise. Um, and um, actually, I do Pilates, which is great. It's the only thing you can do lying down on your back early in the morning, half asleep. It's the best thing you can possibly do for yourself. Um, and you do and this one with an app? Mm hmm no, no, I, I, I go to a, I, I know I used to, God help me on the gym, my wife's idea. And, uh, and the guy who started it was a, as a, as a super athlete, does all these crazy things uh, that we had met. And I met my wife at the gym, God, God help her. And um, um, we, so we had this gym and he, he had space in this new gym for this woman who wanted to start out on her own Pilates studio. And, and he was complaining about her as she was so tough. And I said, I got to try this. If she can make you complain, I got to try this. And I did. And she wasn't that tough. And she's actually a very nice person. And it's uh, it's uh, amplified Pilates in Chicago, if you're ever here and like Pilates. Um, but she's she's a very good businesswoman, has, has, has made a very good business. And so this is probably 10 or 11 years ago. I was one of her first clients independently. And it's just I got into the rhythm of doing this twice a week. And like I said, I do it very early in the morning. And I do it uh, when I'm half asleep. And well, what is early? For you between five and six right or it's early so you're in the pilates studio at five, at five I mean, I, she, she usually gets there at six yeah so yeah um i when i when i do i do uh cycling uh that i do at five because that i can do in my the gym in my in my uh, condo unit what and, time do you go to bed um eh, probably no later than midnight um so you're time, one of those people that yeah I, to to go Function with very little sleep. Yes, and I, the the coffee probably helps. <laughs> but uh, uh, and 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 the other thing I'll tell you is that one of the things that I found having done cycling for, I think I was I was in the first cycling class in Chicago in 1995, uh, and I've been exercising before that otherwise. But um, but I found that as much as I really admire the people who teach these courses, a lot of them, it's a personal journey of self-fulfillment and I'm tired of hearing it. So I found a woman, uh, Charlotte Wiesenbach, who, as you might imagine, is German. And she teaches these courses in German. And it's great because, I mean, she's a very nice woman, very pleasant. Uh, you know, I, I understand three, two, one in German. Um, and then the machine tells me how fast to go. And I, you know, and, and it's just background noise and it's pleasant, but I don't have to think about her personal journey to self-fulfillment, which, which isn't mine. I really do believe that working out is working. So, so I exercise, I read, as I said, I go to concerts, um, play with the cats, um, you know, go to dinner, yeah, the usual thing people do. I I was going to ask that as the last question, but your answer inspired me to ask just one. Uh, oh, that's fine. In terms of your legacy, <laughs> what would you like to leave behind? You're making me feel old now. Um, <laughs> look, I think that 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 the legacy is just, uh, I would like to be, here's somebody that I, that I would list, pay attention to, that I would listen to. That if he wrote something, I'd read it. Uh, if he said something, I'd listen. I wouldn't always agree. Um, but, but at least there wasn't somebody who just, you know, yammered about for yammering sake. I like, I, I hope that what I'm talking about is something people are interested in and, and, you know, add something to the conversation.